were two Republican debates this past week between the four remaining hopefuls for the GOP nomination. And then on Tuesday evening, the president delivered his uh, annual State of the Union address. And the, uh, the main topic of discussion for both the debates and the State of the Union was the economy. And rightfully so. Uh, Americans are clearly concerned about the state of the economy. The unemployment rate, job security, and future financial stability. These are all high-level concerns that touch not only grown-ups, but also affect children because they're the future of our country. Now, we know we live in certain times where our governmental leaders have trouble balancing the books and the budget. But even in times of prosperity, people still worry about money and possessions. See, one of the most stressful areas of life has to do with finances, no matter how you shake it. Concerns over meeting monthly bills, the status of our career economic uncertainties, and the lack of financial stability all have the probability of negatively affecting our health. Now the truth is, money is a real life concern for each of us, and there's no getting around that. You know, when you think about the word money, and possessions for that matter, uh, three words come to mind, worry, fear, and panic, okay? You know, as you do some more research in this area, you find out that financial problems put heavy pressure on the relationships in your life. In fact, the Gallup poll released this report that I'll read to you. It says that 56% of all divorces are the result of financial pressure. It goes without saying that finances is a top concern for most people. Now, knowing this to be true of each of us, no matter who we are, in the Bible, are you ready for this? God has given 2,350 different verses on the topic. In fact, nearly half of Jesus' parables that are recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John have to do with possessions and money. Take it a step further. Jesus talked more about this issue than he did about heaven and hell combined. Now what this means is not that God has a manipulation agenda. On the contrary, God has within his word successful proven principles that, if applied, will not only give you encouragement in the area of finances, but will give you management principles so that you can have some semblance of success in your home, in your life, in your career, whatever pocket of life. And so this subject is not only relative to today because of the state of the economy, but it's also an issue of the heart. You know, We've been talking about health since January 1st. Hard to believe it's already the 29th of January. And for these last few weeks, we've been talking about mental health, transitional health, next week, uh, physical health. We're just going to keep going down the line. But, I mean, it would be a tremendous oversight to talk about health in church and not talk about finances because it's something that everybody wrestles with. And it's something that nobody has the corner on and also, it's something that if you can get healthy, spiritually speaking, in this area, it has the ability to affect every other area of your life. It's, a, it's truly a trickle-down spiritual effect if financially your heart could be right with God, and then it could help. Now, as I begin this topic, you might be, this might be your first time here going, look, I come to church and they're talking about money. Can't believe it. I told you that church over there at the school, that they're all about money. Well, obviously, they're all about money. We meet in a school, okay? And uh, this stand is ready to fall down. We're not about money, trust me. The only thing we own are these speakers and the sign out front, okay? Now, 
since it's a relative issue, and it has to do with the heart, and the Bible talks about it 2,350 times, I think it's a good area to spend some time on. And since you stress about it, and since I stress out about it, why not discuss it in church? Why not, why not hear God's principles? And I think one of the reasons is, is because there's a lot of misunderstanding about this topic. Because we have clowns on TV wearing $2,000 suits saying, give me money and I'll heal your cancer. And I know you got this problem. Touch the screen. Touch your ear. I'll send you oil. Put it on your elbow. Meanwhile, your elbow will turn green. You send in 10, we'll give you 100. I mean, that sounds like a good deal to anybody, okay? And so we understand that those people... You know, Jesus said to Peter, go feed my sheep. He didn't say, go fleece my sheep, okay? And that's what these people do. In, that's, that's a con-making business. That has nothing to do with the cross. That has nothing to do with the empty tomb. That has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. That has nothing to do with the Bible. And there are some established religions that actually set up things for people to pay them as they go when they have to maybe get baptized or get mad. And there's all these different, you know, kind of tolls, if you will, spiritual tolls that are even more than the Verrazano, if you can believe it. And you're laughing because you know it's true. And I've paid a few tolls in my day, and you've paid a few tolls in your day. And it's discouraging. And then we think right off the bat, well, that's what it's all about. No, it's not. And I believe that's a trick of the enemy, the evil one, the devil, because he doesn't want us having peace in our heart about our finances, because so, that that'll, then that'll bring peace to other areas. So there are three misconceptions I want to tell you about financial health right off the top. If you pull your outline out, you can write these down along with me. We need to get these out of the way so that we can understand the rest of our message this morning. First misunderstanding that you need to know. This will help you out a lot. Listen, I'm all for pursuing your dreams. Become a raving success. And as I've told you for, for I don't know how many years now, when you become a great success, don't forget your old Pastor Ray. Okay? All right? Just kidding. Don't forget, don't forget God's church. But listen, this is a misconception about financial health. Here it is. Financial health is dependent on money. You need money to be, you got to make a lot of money, and then you could be financially healthy. You know, if I had a dime every time somebody said, when I hit the lotto, I will, okay, we'd have 10 churches built, okay? Forget about hitting the lotto and, and uh, finding a you know, pot of gold at the, and underneath the boardwalk, or not that there's any, don't go running there after service now, okay? You know, forget about that mentality. It's not just about, I need to get more money, and that will bring health to my situation. That, that's, that's a misconception, and we'll disarm that in a little bit. Secondly, money is evil. Anybody who has any money, they're evil, and so is their money. My friends, that's getting away from a biblical teaching. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, and they'll show this verse on the screen in just a moment, this is what is said about money and evil. It says, for the love of money, say it with me, is the root of all kinds of evil. Interesting. All ki it's the love of money that becomes the root of all other evils in your life. Self-centeredness, pride, sinfulness, covetedness, and just go on down the list. We don't have time. And it says, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness. It's possible to love God and be on the right path and to all of a sudden have resources and forget God and stray away from that path that God had you. So we, you know, we just think it's automatic that you know, if, I get, if I come into money, I'm always going to be the same person that loves God. You've got to be careful. As I've shared with you before, why people who are in the limelight fall off the cliff in their marriages and in their life and they're in and out of rehab centers is because their talents have taken them where their character isn't. And so commercials and popular society teaches your children that the goal of life is to be a raving success. And that's all there is to life. And media pumps that in our children. And what's missing is the character issues. Is that if you can build somebody's character, it doesn't matter how much they have, they'll be a sound individual. And the best character principles come from the Bible. And so money is not... Evil, it's the love of money that's the root of evil. And then here's another misconception, and we all know this is true. Money is the key to happiness. Oh, if I could just have a little more, then I'll be happy. 
Oh, you know, we just, you know, we just need this break, and then it, sure it will relieve some pressure in your life. Trust me, I know, I, I know in my own life and family and history, and I know in your, some of you from sitting there with you at your tables trying to balance budgets and keep lights on and pay mortgages and rents and so forth. You know, the economy has hit a number of people in our church hard, out of work and so forth and on. So I understand that. But trying to find the cash cow, the golden calf, is not going to be the key to your happiness. In fact, look what it says in Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Uh, you might think this was written uh, this morning, but look how relevant this is. Those who love money will never have enough. How meaningless is it to think that wealth brings true happiness? The more you have, the more people come to help you spend it. Have you ever noticed you get all new friends and relatives when you come into money? Right? People haven't called you for years. Okay? And there's always those regular hanger-ons in your life who, you know, who always bleed you. you know? But all of a sudden, there's all new people in your life who want to be your best friend. And, uh, and they, they just come to help you spend your money, actually. And so the question here is, so what good is wealth then except perhaps to watch it slip through your fingers? You know, money does speak. It speaks to me. It says goodbye, okay, when i got to pay my bills and so forth and on. And so those are common misconceptions of money. You don't need money. You don't need to be like Scrooge McDuck and have a whole vault full of coins to swim through. Remember that cartoon? He's, he's diving into money and he's swimming through it. You don't need to have untold wealth to be financially healthy. Money is not evil. It's okay to make it. You just got to do the right thing with it. And money isn't the key to happiness. And as I've told you before, the greatest things in life are in things. It's much more to life than that. And so what I'd like to talk with you today is about financial health. And if you've been coming to Crossroads long enough, you know our heart on this subject. We believe in teaching what the Bible says. We don't believe in manipulation tactics, scare tactics, robbing God messages, or anything crazy like that. We believe in teaching what financial health is in the Bible because we believe that will bring health to other areas of your life. And if you could be a good steward of your life with your finances, it will affect you in every other area of your life. And so the passage I want to direct you to in your Bibles this morning is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And so as you turn there in your Bible, I just want to set the context up for you. The book of Corinthians, as you know, was written by St. Paul, the Apostle Paul. And he wrote this to the church at Corinth. The church at Corinth is primarily made up of non-Jewish believers. What we mean by that is that you have a number of churches, particularly one that we'll also look at today, the church in Jerusalem, that has Jewish believers in it because it's in the holy city, it's in that area. But as you get out of Israel and as you get out of the providence of Jerusalem, you had the spread of the gospel, namely by Peter and John. James, Jesus' half-brother, was the very first pastor of the Christian church. He's the pastor of the church in Jerusalem. But as the gospel spreads, it's the Apostle Paul, Titus, and Timothy taking this very book we have in our hands and sharing the message of Jesus Christ. And so they're spreading the gospel throughout Rome and, and the surrounding areas, and one of those areas is Corinth. Corinth becomes, because of its geographical location, a lot like New York, Corinth was at that time and at that age the crossroads of all trade. And so it was a very popular region, and the church was very large, actually. It started off small, it was a church plant, and then it began to grow. And as the church began to grow, as churches grow, there's problems. There's problems in every church. There was problems in this church. And as Paul dealt with those problems, one of the things he wanted to encourage them in on was their financial health. And so, in chapters 8 and 9 of this book, 2 Corinthians, he's letting them know about something that is very important for them to keep their eye on. And so let's join verse 1 of chapter 9 and find out what it is that the Apostle Paul is encouraging them about, and then we'll see how this leads to financial health. It says this in verse 1 of chapter 9, the Apostle Paul writing to the church of Corinth, he says, now concerning the saints, concerning, concerning the ministering of the saints, it is super flourish for me to write to you. Now let's break this down for a second. Now concerning ministering to the saints, what saints is he talking about? The word saints in the Bible is used to speak of 
living believers. Is that, you know, you would be considered, you're, you're in the, the sainthood of God because you're a believer. This is a common phrase used in the Bible. It doesn't speak of people who are canonized or people who are better than anybody else for whatever spiritual reason. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you're called the sainthood of believers. And so Paul is, this is a, this is a common term used by the Apostle Paul who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. And he says, now, concerning ministering to the saints... Now, to save us some time, we're not going to go ahead and read chapter 8, but who are the saints that he's talking about? He's talking about the church in Jerusalem. Now, you might want to write this down if you're new to the Bible. The very first church of all time was the church in Jerusalem. And that makes perfect sense geographically because that's where everything went down, the crucifixion, the resurrection, the ascension. And so you had there everybody who was in town for the Passover on Good Friday, Christ goes to the cross, dies for our sins, and three days raises from the dead, walks the earth for 40 days before he ascends to the right hand of God the Father in heaven. So it's just natural that that's where all the people were. You had 500 plus eyewitnesses. That's where the first church began. And then the Bible expanded. It tells us as the church expanded. And so as you begin to put all this together and you begin to look at world history, we also know that a famine hit Jerusalem. Plus, there were tough economical times. You had all these people in for the Passover, and they now said, we're going to worship where the apostles are. We're not going to go back home. We're going to move our families, and we're going to sit under the teaching of James, of Peter, of John. You would do the same thing. You now believe in Jesus Christ, the Messiah. You're going to hear directly from his apostles. And so what happened was you had all this population boom. You had economic trouble. You had a famine. You know what that turns into? financial problems. Now, that went on for years. The Corinthian church, they're strong. They're strong in agriculture. They're strong geographically. They're strong financially. And so Paul appeals to the Corinthian church and says, you need to help the church in Jerusalem. Are you with me so far? Okay. And so there's a need in Jerusalem. The church in Corinth is able to meet the need. Paul says, now concerning ministering to the saints, that speaking of the church, the church in Jerusalem, he says, it's super flourish for me to write you. Now, what in the world does super flourish mean? Is that like a, like a special kind of floss to get the chicken wings out of your teeth after you watch the game? Right? What, what does super flourish mean? Uh, you know, sometimes these translators from the Greek to the English, you know, they've got to come up with better words. But basically what it means is it just means, it, you know, it's, it's really unnecessary for me to say this because I've already said it and because some of you have already begun to do it and some of you have already promised to do it. In other words, that's what he's saying here. For I know your willingness. So that qualifies that, that uh, floss word right there. For I know your willingness about which I've boasted to the Macedonians. Macedonia, again, was another region. Uh, you know, Thessalonica is over there, the church at Berea. He's saying that I've let everybody know about you and your willingness. And that uh, Asia, which is actually the providence of Corinth, I let them know uh, that Asia was ready a year ago. And your zeal has stood up the majority. And so what Paul is saying is your willingness to give to the church in Jerusalem, word has got out about that, and other people have joined in because of your mentality in that. And it says, yet I have sent the brethren, and he sent Titus, who was one of his understudies at this point in his journey, Paul. That's why we have the book of Titus. He says, least our boasting should be in, in vain in this respect, as I've said to you, that you may be ready. And so you want to underline the word ready. He's going to say, allude to this a number of times. And then it goes on to say in verse 5, I'll jump verse 4 for the sake of time, Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go ahead of you of the time, and again prepare, ready, same word in the Greek, for your generous gift beforehand, which you have previously promised, that it may be a matter of generosity, not as a matter of grudgingly, uh, grudging obligation. And so Paul is driving at something here. He's saying, one, remember the need in Jerusalem. Two, I know you promised that you want to do it. And three, we're coming to collect that offering for the church of Jerusalem, but I want you to get ready. And I don't want you to get ready with grub grudging obligation. He's saying you don't give out of obligation. Now, some of you might be scratching your head and say, that's all I grew up in. I've, I've been pressured to give all my life. That's what I thought it was. I thought it was like a tax when I came to church. You know, uh, and it's interesting, you know, I've been around long enough because of my faith background and, and being a pastor that I've heard all sorts of stories, 
Okay? I've heard of churches having triple tied Sunday <laughs> when they pass the basket around three times. We've never done that if you're new. We, we'll never do that. Don't worry. Okay? You know, there's different things where if you have a past and you, perhaps you want to get married in the church, you know, they'll say no at first blush, but if you could write a certain size check, you know, uh, we'll marry you on Christmas Day if you could write the right check, okay? And, you know, we hear all, and we all, and listen, I don't need to, to pepper you on that. You probably have your own stories of things in your own family of things that went on. The fact of the matter is, is that God has healthy principles, not manipulation tactics. And if you're going to be financially healthy, we've got to look at the principle that's emerging from this, this incredible text. Paul is saying that in order for you to be spiritually and financially healthy, Corinthian church, I want you to understand the importance of giving to this church, but you've got to prepare yourself. You've got to be ready. Don't do it with a grudging obligation. Do it for the right reasons. And in order for them to be free to do this, Paul is driving at a mentality that each of us need to have, that this Corinthian church he was trying to encourage them with. And if you want to be healthy in any, every other area of your life, if you want to st start, start kicking habits that get the best of you, you want to get a hold on anxiety and stress and other things in your life, you want to get a hold on living right for the Lord, then here's a great biblical principle. I like to think of this as the bedrock of your Christianity. Here it is today, this morning, on January 29, 2012, a foundation piece for you to build on in your faith. Financial health results from believing that God is the owner and I am the manager. Big difference. And that's what he's sharing here with this Corinthian church. You're ready, make sure you're ready. Don't do it for the wrong reasons. And if you study chapters 8 and 9 together, he actually references the fact that Jesus Christ gave so much, he gave his life. And that we need to be strong in this area. You know, somebody once said the highest level of living is giving. It's so true. You know, when you put all of this together, it's a principle for life. God, you're the owner. I'm the manager. But see, when we're the owner of things, we do things backwards, don't we? You know, when we're the owner, we get ourselves in all sorts of trouble. We think that it's all about us. You know, just put this principle in a marriage. Put it raising kids. Put it in your everyday life if you're not married. And how we, how we even look for the right person that's supposedly going to put the women in our sails and fill our needs. You know, it's just a total misconception of life to think that it's all about me. It's about God. It's about what he wills for our life. And get this. If you agree to that and make that become the staple of your life, i got news for you. You're not going to get to heaven knocking on God's throne going, what a mistake it was, God, to make you the owner of my life. You're going to be so much happier in your life. And guess what? As we said earlier, it's not going to be dependent upon how many zeros you have at the end of your paycheck. It's not going to be uh, dependent upon how, how, many, how, how nice your curves are in your body or how, how big your frame is or the, this type of car you drive. Not that any of those things are wrong, but they're wrong if we make those the object of our life. And so God is the owner. I'm the manager of what God gives me. You know, a friend of mine works for a business, uh, you know, and actually that business oversees a number of restaurants. One of them is Olive Garden. And I know about you. I mean, I love my Italian food, and their main dishes, you know, I'm not a big fan of them. Okay, I'll be honest with you. You know, one time I went there, and they served me chicken parmesan. I said to the waiter, is this chicken nugget parmesan? I mean, this was the smallest. Thing. You know, so you know, they're not down with the whole Italian portion thing, you know. And, um, you know, I get that. But you've got to love that free, that unlimited breadstick and soup thing. Man, that's the, you know, I ain't meant for small blessings, you know. And I just love that, that, that fact of the olive going. But as I was talking with, talking with the gentleman who works for the company that manages it, he's one of their financial um, analysts, he was telling me, because I was saying, you know, these restaurants, they're so detailed, you know, like I was noticing, you know, you know, every glass is the same and how the light fixtures are. I noticed things like that from a business standpoint. I said, man, these things are run like a fine oil machine. And he said, well, how it is is there's one owner and then there's a manager for every one. And a number of restaurants have that model, but this one uh, really has, you know, Olive Garden turns over a tremendous profit every year because of their small portions and breadsticks, I bet, you know. But, but you know, whatever the case is, they turn over a great profit. And the thing is, is that it's the manager's job to take what the owner has said to do and to do it. And that's what makes for a successful business. And my friends, that's what makes for a successful life. When you realize God owns it all, 
And he has blessed you so you can be a blessing. In fact, that's what he told Abraham in Genesis 12. When he said, Abraham, I'm blessing you to be a blessing. I'm not blessing you to be a selfish, greedy person. See, when you begin to look at this, not just with money, look at it with your talents. That the abilities that you have with these hands, God wants you to use them for his glory. Listen, go be a raving success. Go make, go make a lot of money. Go be great. Go, go be great in your craft. Start a business. Wonderful. But never forget it's God who gave you the ability from birth to do so. And when you do that, that will free you up to be so much more in God. And take that principle and put it in every area of your life. Yeah, that's why I have to say, I really, and so, some of you uh, maybe share this affection, I really took a liking to uh, the football player Tim Tebow for the Denver Broncos. And, you know, he gets a lot of slack. Oh, he's a virgin. He's, oh, he does this and he does that. Everybody puts the guy down. But we never put down the, the quarterback who has uh, seven girlfriends and five kids with five different women. That's okay, though. Okay? That's how our society thinks. But we'll make fun of this kid. And they got on him because he kneels down and he prays and this, that, and the other thing. Like, that's a bad thing. Then you have players doing uh, you know, uh, inappropriate movements with their hips when they score a touchdown. You'll never hear anything. That's okay, though. That's cool. Okay, that's cool. That's not cool. And you know what? One of the reasons why I think this kid is so blessed, I mean, he, he, ha he takes people with disabilities, okay, to the game, flies them out in their family, puts them in the stands, spends time with them, people on their deathbed. I mean, this guy does amazing things because he realizes, you know what? I'm the manager. And he has all that fame. Imagine if more athletes thought like that. Imagine if more people of fame, instead of giving $500,000 when there's a disaster, that's like you and I giving five cents when you make $30 million on a movie, okay? And we're supposed to go, oh, wow, <laughs> there they come. You know what? Giving isn't about an amount. It's about the heart. It was Jesus who said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be what? Also. God's the owner. I'm the manager. That's how life works. I want you to jot these things down quickly. Uh, we don't have a slide for this. When, you, when you're the owner of everything, this is how you think. This is the number one priority when, we're the, when Ray's the owner. Acquire. I got to get, 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 get. Now, I took a love language test. You know what my love language is? Giving. I know, no, I'm sorry, getting. Okay. I wish it was giving. I like to give, but, you know, getting comes first. And by the way, it just happens to fall this way. My birthday's this week. I'm just throwing that out there. Okay, just <laughs> throwing that out there. So everybody's work Listen, I told you before, I'm not perfect. Okay, I'm working on, God's working on me just as much as he's working on you. Okay. Now, now, all seriousness now, acquire is, the, when you're the owner, when it's about you, I got to get, I got to get, I got to get, acquire is number one. Number two is enjoy. You know, hey, hey you got to live, live it out, you know. You know, just got to live and enjoy it all. Let's party, party, party. Enjoy, enjoy, enjoy. Second, thirdly is repay. Got to repay that debt. Four is save. Got to start saving. Got to save up. And usually we're saving to go buy something else, but saving. Now I'm going to give. Here comes the bucket. You know what? Here, okay, here comes the big, you know, I mean, here I come, here I come. I'm going to put a little in now. Who's, anybody see me do that? Okay, here I go again. Okay? And then I plan. Okay, I'm going to have a plan. That's, that is the owner's mentality uh, when you think you own it all. Acquire, enjoy, repay, save, give, plan. Here's the manager's plan. Dedicate first. God, it's yours. God, my life is yours. God, my purity, my sexuality is yours. God, my home is yours. God, my abilities and talents to swing a bat, to swing a hammer, to sew, to do a computer, to cut hair, whatever, I mean, whatever it is, to sing, to perform. It's for you. I dedicate it to you. My ability to give out wisdom and counsel is for you. My ability to manage is for you. I dedicate it to you. My friends, this is so important to your life. You've probably experienced untold stress in your life for a number of different reasons that I, I'm, not, I'm not capable of diagnosing, but I will encourage you in this way. That if you from this day forward say, God, I want to dedicate my life to you. That's why we dedicate babies. I want to dedicate my life to you, God, for your glory. 
it don't matter if, if you're intelligent enough to understand all of this. I'm going to tell you, I'm not intelligent enough to understand all of this. I don't know everything there is to know in the Bible. When we get to heaven, we'll have all of eternity to figure things out. But I know some of the core truths that I'm sharing with you today that commit to being the manager. The managers, after the manager dedicates, the manager plans. I'm going to do this with my money. I'm going to have a budget, basically. You want to get a budget. You want to have a monthly budget for your life. Thirdly, God's manager gives. God's manager says, I'm going to be a giver. God's done so much for me. It's part of my worship to give, not an obligation. No envelopes coming around to your house. and pastor's not going to make a visit to twist your arm or anything like that. Plan. Give. And then save. Saving is a very important part of your life. Save, repay debt, even if it's just a little bit a month. Send just a little bit in. And then enjoy. So you may have thought, I could become a Christian, it's going to be terrible now, and we can't have any fun. On the contrary. I, I, I have more fun now than I've ever had in all my life. And I wasn't a follower of the stupid kids. I was the leader of the stupid kids. Okay. I was, you know, I, I'm, I'll be honest with you. Okay? I wasn't a follower. I was the, actually the, the one who set things up. And so I'm telling you, I have more fun now, enjoying my life now in Christ, than I did years ago. And I believe that this is a principle of life when you say, God, I want to manage my life for you. It's not, you know, a lot of people go one of two ways. Either they live so carnal in that they give God no glory in their life, you wouldn't even know if they knew what a cross of a hit them in the head, okay? And then you have people that go overboard and they try to overcompensate and they try to use all God language. You know those people, right? You know, God blesses, you know, and, and holy, and everything's out of their mouth. And good for your words, but what about your heart? Jesus said, you know, I hear what comes out of your mouth, your lips, I hear what they're saying, but your heart is far from me, Jesus said. And that was a quotation from the book of Isaiah. That's a pet peeve of God, that our heart would be right. Forget about the exterior stuff. It's not about what we wear and how we do this. It's about the heart. In fact, God said it the best. He said, man looks at the outward appearance, but I care about the what? The heart. And how you have a right heart with God is you say, God, I'm the manager of whatever you give me, not the owner. Does that make sense? Yeah. Let's look at this last principle before we close. We said financial health, it's the result from believing. You've got to believe it. It's got to be a conviction. The things that you do in life, you, you believe in it and you go forward. When God's the owner and you're the manager, you're not bellyaching about and complaining about everything that doesn't go your way. You know what? There's times I start complaining. You can ask Jen. I, 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 can, I can complain like the best of them, okay? Sometimes I think I got the, the unspiritual gift of complaining, and some of you share that gift, okay? And blame shifting. We all go through that. But when God's the owner, and I'm, I'm just happy to be alive. I'm just happy that I drew breath today. I'm just happy that I, that I got stuff to manage for God. And so financial health results believing it's a conviction that God's the owner, I'm the manager. And secondly, and finally, financial health results from believing that generosity reaps blessing. It reaps blessing. That if I'm going to be financially healthy, i got to be a generous person. I, I can't be... Now, again, financial health isn't determined by the size of your bank account. You can have a very big bank account, but still be financially unhealthy because of your spending habits. And when you think about the fact that we're called to be managers and not owners, and we start looking at the issues of life, and we start thinking about the rest of the world, that the rest of the world outside of the States lives on less than $2 a day, you know what we begin to see? We don't have a money problem. We have a spending problem in America, actually. Spend too much. And we inflate businesses and banks our courts are way out of control. They make too many decisions from the bench that, uh, you know, the, the founding framers of our country did not set this justice system up that it would have this level of authority. It's actually an abuse of authority, and it actually divides the country. You got people, you know, in the previous elections, people were choosing parties over a number of different reasons. I think in this next election, people are starting to smell the coffee, and they're saying, we want to cast a vote for somebody who's the real McCoy. 
We want to forecast the vote for somebody who isn't just talking about the other guy, but that actually has real, tangible ideas that are not only going to fix our country today, but preserve our freedom for the years to come. You know, I think people are fed up with this. And you just watch, mark my words, later this year, the reports will come out. These candidates on both sides of the aisle will spend close to a billion dollars to run for President of the United States of America. And the unemployment rate is where it's at. And uncertainty is where it's at in the economy. And you know what? I think it is simply childish to blame one person or one party. I think it's childish to do that. Okay? Last, thing, last time I checked, when there's a problem in a family, and I think of America as a family, families got to roll up their sleeves and do something about it together. And not blame everybody. Everybody's too busy blaming everybody. Let's have somebody get up there and offer some real solutions with some tangible numbers, and then maybe we'll get down to business. But in those tangible numbers, what we always have to remember is that no matter what the plan is from 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, no matter what's decided in the Congress, no matter what local officials and how they allocate money, you're still responsible for your own heart. And generosity needs to be at the center of it. You know, as Paul was encouraging these Corinthians, he said to them in the previous chapter, remembering what Jesus did, that he became poor so we could become rich. Jesus left heaven, came in the form of a child. This is a king was born in a, not, not, not just in a, a dilapidated house, he was born in a feeding trough in the cattle van's area, better known as the manger in our English culture, where animals eat and go to the bathroom, okay? And he was born at night in the dirty trough because when we become a believer in Jesus Christ, he's not born into perfect conditions, he's born into a dirty heart that we have. And as he lived, the Bible says the Son of Man had no place to lay his head. So that knocks out all those cronies and phonies that have the word of faith belief. Oh, just speak it and it will happen. And I'm, I'm, I, I get a little crazy with this because I just can't stand that. Because first of all, it's just not true. Were there people in the Bible who were very wealthy? Sure, Abraham, Solomon, David, wonderful. The lady who started the church in Philippians, uh, Lydia had the purple uh, fabric business, wonderful. So there's a lot of poor people in the Bible. Spiritual health and your spiritual uh, faith is not based on how much money you have. That's a joke. That's a lie from the pits of hell. That's people who just want more. And usually those preachers live in $5 million mansions. Okay? I don't even call them preachers. They're pretenders. Because they actually do research and they see what town has a high cancer rate. Well, we're going to talk a lot about cancer that week when we go there. Oh, how many disabled people do we have? People, people who've had back surgery. People who've had neck surgery. We're going to talk about that. And so there's a whole scheme on that. And those people, you know, and they like to usually vacation in hot spots, they better get it right or they're going to they're gonna be spending eternity in a hot spot, okay, if they don't get it right, okay? The truth is, is that God, God, God does not look kindly upon those who try to use something so precious as this topic to fatten their pockets. They're charlatans, not servants. Verse 6 says this, but I say this, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Um, sowing and reaping, I think everybody knows what that means. You know, we're not much for the planting type, perhaps, or raising a farm, but, but if you were to have a farm, you know, that's what Paul is using an agricultural term, and if you're going to sow sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. And I have something that I'd like to illustrate this for you with, and this is a spreader. And this is our life, you know. God, God's the owner. You know, we're a spreader, you know. And, and we got to manage it in such a way, we got to be generous in such a way that as we go through our life, we're effectively sowing the seeds, effectively. If we're going to reap effectively, this is what I like to call a law of life. You know, there are different laws, right? There's the law of, um, of electricity. You know about that law. Now, you believe in that law, and you've never seen that law. Even though you see the effect of it, the lights go on. I got one better for you. You believe in that law, and you pay for that law. Okay? All right? Um, so, you know, we don't, we don't see how it works in the world, but we have electric. Okay? The law of electricity. Okay? We know that there is the, uh, the law of uh, thermodynamics. Uh, we know about the law of, uh, of internal combustion. Okay? There's the law of gravity. Okay? For example, now, this isn't too high up, but you know what? You know, if I want, if this was maybe like 10 feet higher, 
the law of gravity would start giving me butterflies in my stomach. I mean, I've always wanted to fly like Superman, but, but the law of gravity takes over at some point. This is a law of life, that if you sow right, you will reap right. Does that make sense? This is a great principle for life here. So he says, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. The word bountifully is a logo in the Greek language, and it means blessing. That as you bless, you will be blessed in great return. So if I throw out out of this spread of apple seeds, I'm not going to get pears, okay? If I throw grass out of here, it's grass seed, okay? Uh, dollar bills is not going to come up, for example. It's what you're putting out. And this spreader has a mechanism on it that you could adjust it if you want to go a little more, a little less. And I like to think of this as your capacity in life. As you develop talents, as you accumulate wealth, you need to adjust this lever and give according to how God blesses you. You know, at Crossroads, we don't teach tithing, which is 10%. I think 10% is a number mentioned in the Old Testament. The New Testament does not mention it. The New Testament talks of something even better than tithing. It talks about sacrificial giving, that you're to be sacrificial. God doesn't want you to take food out of your daughter's mouth. God actually wants you to be a better manager. And in the process, he wants your, your yearnings to match your earnings, okay? He wants you to be wiser altogether. But ultimately, you know what it comes down to? You need to be sacrificial. Just look at your cable bill. If your cable bill is more than you give to the Lord, well, you've got to look at that. You know, if, if your uh, trip to Dunkin' Donuts over the course of seven days is more than you're offering, you need to look at that. See, there are things you can do in your life right now that you'll be able to give like you've always wanted to give, and all you're doing is just being a better manager. 